Hey, this is Mahabali from the American University in Cairo, and with me are Autumn and Mia. Uh, today, we're going to be trying out a liberating structure while we're actually thinking through a real thing that we're doing together. Um, we're going to try a liberating structure called appreciative interviews. Um, and let me just um, bring up the page for that on the liberating structures website. Um, just to let you know, uh, usually this activity would be done in pairs and then after the pairs, you would uh, sit in groups of four and we're just gonna do it in threes and just do the steps, but not in the same you know, numbers. Um, this one is developed by, of course, Henry Lipmanovich and Keith McCandless, but it's inspired by um, adapted, and adapted from Professor David Kuprider, Case Western Reserve University and consultant Dr. Tony Suchman or Suchman. And the idea of it is to sort of, you know, try to discover and build on the roots of causes of success. So you're trying to structure, you're like you're building something new, but you're trying to build on the success you've had in the past and focusing on what has worked in the past to generate a list of, you know, sort of elements that are essential for success. And you sort of just started out with getting people in groups of, of in pairs or trios, and then giving each of them maybe like five minutes to talk about, to tell a story about a time that something worked well, they were proud of it, they accomplished something good and what made the success possible. And the idea is to give everyone around the same time to do that. And then the person who's doing the interview for the other can take notes, but they, can, they can't ask like questions that are really way off and they can't say, oh, that happened to me too. But you can say things like, oh, tell me more about that or how did that work? And just ask them to sort of probing questions to ask them a bit more detail, but not not structure the direction of the conversation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any other ideas. This is the first time I actually do this one. <laughs> okay, so I think that'll be fine. So for our um, purposes here, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to talk to me about a, sort of a, like a workshop or a professional development event that you organized recently or that you saw recently that was very successful, that you thought went well. Um, and then you can, of course, define what you consider to be successful in a professional development event. Um, and then because I'm on my phone, I won't be able to take notes, but I'm gonna ask each of you to take notes when one of us is talking. You can choose anything that you've been in recently, or you can pick elements of success, I guess, out of several things that you've been to, that should be fine, or that you've done. How does that sound? That sounds yeah. good. All right, is, is any of you ready to share about one or do you want me to, to do that? I think I'm ready. I have two okay. different um, experiences in mind. And so the first thing I have is just a brief question about choosing a, one from the other. One was a meeting that occurred uh, about a week ago that I thought was productive. And then the other is more like um, an ongoing collaboration with a team. So which one do you think would be most applicable to this context? Or does it matter? Which one, which, which one can you talk about in five minutes? <laughs> um, maybe the one that happened recently, just because I think that one is fresh in my mind. So how okay. about that? All right, and I'll time you for five minutes and then Autumn can take notes of the, yeah, sounds good. Okay, go ahead, Mia. Okay. So um, the event that I wanted to share with you guys as a kind of sample of possible positive things that emerged um, is the inclusive academia um, planning meeting that we had with a team um, from Equity and Bound. Um, it's a team of approximately, I think it's seven other people attended the meeting. Um, and uh, we are busy trying to roll out um, a rather um, ambitious workshop that deals with anti-racism um, in the area of academia. And we're trying to think about how to make more expansive um, and inclusive the uh, experience of teaching and learning and scholarship at the university and in higher ed. Um, and so we have a very, as I said, ambitious project um, but we started, we've had a few conversations and this one um, sort of was a follow-up conversation. And what I found very productive about this meeting 
is that we didn't jump into an insistence on um, outcomes and goals right away. First, we started to discuss values um, and even our dispositions within the context of our shared values. Um, and it led to the ability for some people to share concerns with certain terminology that they felt uncomfortable with. So as an example, um, the term inclusion became something that we probed a little bit more, thought about a little bit more deeply together. We talked about that inferred in the word inclusion itself is the suggestion that there is a positioning or a place to be that everyone is striving to be a part of and that that in and of itself is um, a problem and how much we all wanted to dismantle that sort of impulse or understanding and how we might be able to go about that. Um, we also uh, in sort of um, sort of th uh, uh, threading that idea apart, we also came upon um, moments where we ended up sharing personal anecdotes that had happened to us recently in our work that um, ended up being very formative to us in thinking about these very ideas uh, regarding um, what it means to be a part of a certain scholarly procedure or practice um, and what expectations we bring to it and what kinds of ways in which we can be disheartened or feel like an openness or an expansion that's happening. So i.e. Um, like maybe changing the way we do things to make sure that other perspectives are included within the way we traditionally do things. So those personal anecdotes that came forth in the conversations um, actually became a really important touchstone for what we're imagining our practice to be in these workshops. And finally, we sort of um, hit upon the idea that we're seeking to give people reference points in terms of conversational experiences that matter in their thinking about difference and navigating um, the uh, academia and about um, the politics of difference and how we experience that. So um, one of the things that emerged was, again, this idea that we're going to um, seek out creating an experience for people and that we also think storytelling is an important part of that. We ourselves were storytelling in the meeting and so in a way there was this kind of layered or meta aspect of what we were exploring together through conversation and what we wanted to make possible moving forward as a purposeful workshop with a bunch of people from a bunch of different places in order to um, be expansive thinking and inclusive thinking again with 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 an uh, asterisk around that word inclusive, but at any rate, um, in terms of uh, proceeding in higher education. Um, so I think that we also, there was one other idea that came out that was important to me, which is the idea that sometimes when people tell stories, you don't necessarily have to be the storyteller to feel like your story was told and that you feel a, a new sense of understanding and belonging within the context of community. So we also took that into account, both in the way we proceeded with the meeting, but also in the way that we want to design for this workshop. So stepping back um, and to sort of cap, um, to summarize a little bit, we proceeded in the meeting in a very intuitive way, listening to each other, telling each other stories, and also talking about the things we're concerned about in terms of making mistakes or bringing forth old ways of doing something when we um, take on this ambitious workshop, which is all about uh, transformation and change. And so we listened to each other and um, we shared angles on things. And then we gave each other the space to sort of steep in those ideas to figure out next moves. So we didn't fixate on the next moves as much as we listened to each other and um, identified values together. Um, and then even observed the ways that we were able to do that as possibilities for practice in the future. Um, so I think I'm gonna end there. I don't know if I took up my five minutes or less than, but that's where I feel like I've 
come to a close of my story. <laughs> it took exactly five minutes. Um, and I was, I'm just going to admit that I was tempted to ask you questions in the middle, but I stayed quiet and you answered them without me having to say that because you sort of went into a little bit the details. Uh, because I was in that meeting, that might be partly why you, you went into the details. Um, but then you brought it back into key elements of success. And I've been taking notes, and I think Autumn has been taking notes as well. Um, Autumn, are you ready to discuss one, or do you want me to do one? <clears throat> um, I can. I have a couple of things that I wrote down. One of the things that uh, stood out to me was that you didn't start with outcomes, but rather with values. Mm. Autumn, can we wait on... on um, giving her feedback on her thing itself. I was just giving a okay. comment on the process that um, that she focused too much on the content of the meeting when we were trying to tease out the elements of success. And then I want to listen to your story of a recent success. And then I'll give oh. it a story of success. And then the three of us will reflect on elements of success across our three and start talking about that. Do you know what I mean? For the appreciative interview approach. So, to mm -hmm. sort of work. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Do you have I, a success story that you want to talk about, or do you want me to <sighs> give one and then? Maybe you could give one. I'm still, I'm still thinking about a few. Oh. I'm okay. sorry. No, no, no problem. Um, so, actually, it's very interesting because even though I planned to use this, uh, I keep ch changing my mind about which one I want to talk about. <laughs> but I actually want to talk about one where I was not the facilitator. Uh, but I was the recipient of it. It was one of the free meetups for liberating structures. And this was one of the first of the Texas uh, liberating structures that I uh, attended. Uh, so I didn't know anyone at all or their context or anything in the meeting. Uh, and it was an hour and a half, but it was an hour and a half of really, really productive um, conversations. Basically, they were doing a meta thing where it was a using liberating structures to reflect on our own practice of liberating structures. Uh, it worked out really well for me because I've been using liberating structures for a long time and because most of the people who were with me in breakout rooms were. I think maybe if there were new people, it wouldn't have been so successful because some of these are like that. So that's an important thing, I think, is if you know your audience or mainly have this thing in common, then you can, I think do something deeper or of a certain kind. But when you know that some people are not, then you need to consider how the prompt would work differently for them um, if they don't have that experience. Um, and the, the thing that worked really well is just the order of how we did the different things is I think we started with appreciative interviews <laughs> like this one, to sort of figure out what works well when you're doing liberating structures. And then we went into uh, the nine whys of, oh, I think we actually did the nine whys, not appreciative review. So we're like, why, why, why does it work? Why do you use it? Why do you like you doing it in, your, in practice? And then we went into um, something else, which was the wicked questions, which is what are two contradictory paradoxical things that you do for liberating structures and how would you make them work? And then we went through a process of different groups of us discussing those paradoxes and what they mean. Um, and first of all, you got to work with a lot of different people in the room. So if there were maybe like 40 people in the room, because there were three or four type of breakout activities, I like the fact that I got to meet at least 12 people of the 40 in the room. And of course, there was also some stuff that was happening in the main room where people spoke up. So you also got to see people in the main room. So what I thought was interesting is my first time there, but I got to meet like, I don't know, 15, 20 people. And I felt like I had a productive conversation and a meaningful conversation. I got to know their context and I got to um, know a lot about them as individuals, uh, even as we focused on answering the prompts. Uh, that's really important to me because I, I don't want to just be doing a task without getting to know the people. I've been in a lot of events where you uh, get something done as a group but you don't actually get to know each other or build community or build teamwork or feel like you want to see these people again, you know, so. Do I still have time or is my time up? I think my time is up. I didn't put a timer on, but I feel like it's proximate. It feels like around five minutes. Sorry if it's okay. intuitive. <laughs> yeah, I think, it is. I think it's, it's, you finished at 25 past and it's 30 past for me. So we talked a little bit in the middle, but it's good. Did someone take notes? 
I did a little bit. I took a little bit of notes. I'm sorry. It, it oh, definitely no, happened. Fine. The transition happened very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, the, the problem, the thing that I'm struggling with, and you can go ahead and uh, start the timer whenever, because I think I, I think I can do this, but I'm going to maybe trouble like the prompt a little bit because I don't have a particular event, like I'm struggling to have a particular event to reflect on. But what I do have is a ton of experience with virtually connecting. I keep going back to the virtually connecting um, structure, right, where you have not just um, a virtual event, but you actually have an, uh, you know, what we would call the on-site, you know, uh, uh, component where we have a whole group that are um, in a particular place together. And then we have, a, you know, sometimes even a larger group that are all dispersed in terms of their, um, in terms of their locality. And so bringing those groups together uh, in a way that expresses um, equity um, in that particular situation is something that I'd like to sort of reflect on at like a larger level. So um, the thing that stands out to me, uh, thinking about virtually connecting kind of as a whole or collectively is this separation between something that's happening uh, together and then you have these folks who are all dispersed and, and bringing the, the idea of sort of bringing that experience of what's happening with those folks who are collective almost like they're giving a gift, right? That they're giving something to those folks who are all dispersed to bring some of that uh, some of that excitement, some of that, um, uh, some of the the knowledge that is happening there at that site, that everything is happening together to those folks who are not able to come and not able to be there. Um, there was definitely amongst all of the different uh, situations, right? Um, trying to think about how the folks who are there together collectively, who are who are they? Making sure that there are different voices represented, making sure that there are different um, people who are bringing a diverse, you know, background and mindset uh, to the table, because there's a certain element of amplification as well. And um, trying to think about space, environment in the on-site group specifically, and thinking about uh, trying to find a place that, well, actually uh, either, right? Like there's, there's kind of two different dynamics. You can find a space that is quiet, so that way, you know, you can really kind of focus on that group who's together, but there's definitely were instances when in doing virtually connecting where it was very chaotic or we were in a hallway somewhere or um, even outside. I can think of, uh, you know, some instances where people would like take the laptop or whatever and balance it on a trash can, right? Um, so, but, but that does change the dynamic. And so thinking about um, the, what's happening in that online space because each of the folks who are coming in virtually they're pro they're more individual so they're thinking about their own space right um which also can be dynamic uh in those different spaces i can think of some instances where people were working on like a cell phone while they're you know listening in and they're like stocking shelves or something like that um so I'm very, I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned through virtually connecting in, um, in thinking about how to bring a physical space, a place where people are physically gathering to a virtual audience that is dispersed. Um, and I think that some of the things that make that work are paying attention to the environments that you're using in the uh, in the, the locally gathered space. 
that that can be providing a more, I guess, sanitary environment that's like optimized for sound and optimized for visuals, but that there is something fun about making it a little bit more chaotic that I wouldn't necessarily want to, like just taking a phone out into an area that people have agreed it's okay to be recorded, um, maybe like a coffee hour or reception or something like that, if everybody in that area was okay with it being recorded. Um, you know, having somebody come into it and, re you know, letting other folks who are there know that, um, you know, that there's, there's people with me. I have people with me. And um, so I'll end it there. Thank you, Autumn. Okay, so I think what we can do now, usually we would be then joining another group of people and telling each other's stories or saying what we've heard from each other's stories. What I think might be helpful is if one of us shares the screen right now um, and we take notes, like you've, if you've taken notes or if you have memories of what are the key things that other people said in their stories that we put them in and then maybe fill in anything that we thought was key in our story that didn't end up there. Uh, just like maybe take a couple of minutes to do that. So, Autumn, can you share your screen or are you going to are you going to be comfortable doing it? You took notes on paper, right? I took I notes on the Google Doc of when both Perfect. of you were speaking um, of key things that I thought were elements. So I'm not going to take any more notes. But like if someone uh, like so, so I've got notes from Mia. So if then Autumn has anything else to add or different terminologies that you used. Um, and I took notes from Autumn. So, again, if Mia took different notes and then maybe if someone types in notes that you took for when I was speaking. Um, let's just take a couple of minutes to do that and while we're sharing the screen so people can see what we're doing. Or maybe this is gonna get boring for someone to watch. So let me actually read out what's there while Autumn. Is that gonna be too distracting for you if I read out what no. other people? Okay, Go so ahead. I'm going to take my notes from when Mia was speaking and then, all right. So when Mia was speaking, I took these elements of success, which are value sharing, uh, the sharing of personal experiences or anecdotes, and the building of practice on those values and anecdotes. And then later she talked about, you wait on talking about next moves and what to do next until you talk about values and listen to each other's stories first. Uh, she mentioned the meta aspect, which I was trying to sort of abstract what it was that she was saying that would be a key element. She gave it a lot more nuance than that in context, but I thought just if we just say meta aspect, that's a thing to keep in mind. Um, she talks about expansive and inclusive thinking, about intuitive um, stuff, about listening, bringing up concerns. I think that's maybe something that sometimes when you're in a thing, you're just moving on with the thing, but not making room for listening to people's concerns and bringing them up. But that, that we were still trying to do something ambitious in that event, and then the space to steep in ideas to figure next moves. Um, I don't know if, Autumn, did you hear anything different or more or that you would name differently? And then we'll ask Mia if she's comfortable with those, with that list of things. Yeah. Uh... Uh, that sounds good to me. I think that um, the only thing that I uh, kind of identified was uh, it really I thought it was interesting using expansive and inclusive together, but maybe that's more about the content than the uh, than the structure. What do you mean? Could you say that again? Sorry. That was just me not concentrating. Oh, <laughs> I think it's more about the content than it is about the structure necessarily. For me, as actually, yeah. Autumn, I think that there is a way in which we can think of it um, as uh, about a structure too. So you were just um, drawing out the it, within my anecdote the question of the tension between uh, being inclusive versus being or instead thinking of it as expansiveness. And mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to bring it back to the structural aspects of things by saying that in a way, um, the waiting on things and letting it um, grow and um, through 
writing and documentation afterwards and then next steps sort of emerging in a way. I think that's a sort of uh, move to make something expansive rather than just including everything. Mm -hmm. including, you know, getting all the ideas at once. Maybe I'm being a little too, um, you know, from theory to practice too much, but I do see that those two words are interesting and important, both in content of what I'm saying, you know, the ambitions we have, but also in the way that we're practicing it, which is a structural concern as well. It reminded me of the, uh, maybe the place that we're going to go next, uh, the wicked problems right? That you have to yeah, kind exactly. of want, it's a paradox, right? You want these two things, but they're sort of in opposition to one another in a way. Yeah. Although I hadn't thought of it that way until you guys mentioned it. I hadn't thought of expensive and inclusive as oppositional. I yeah. actually think of expensive and option, op opposition, inclusive. actually. Yeah. I think they're actually complementary. Yes. Well, I think one um, sort of uh, is a better nuance, I mean, a better um, refinement, that's what I want to say, a better refinement of the other. So inclusion is a good impulse, but then it, as I discussed before, it might mean that there's some place that's special that everybody has to get to. While expansiveness right. is really um, more focused on the opening of things and discovering new places, yeah. which I like better. Yeah, and that naturally makes it makes inclusiveness easier because whatever it is that you're including people into has become bigger and broader. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Uh, do you feel like there are any other elements, Mia, that you meant that didn't come out? Well, I think um, I I'm just making sure it's there in the document, but the storytelling thing that, that people, yeah, there. yes, yes. That yes. people I didn't choose the story. term though. Yeah. I said sharing personal experience and anecdotes, but maybe I'll write the word storytelling here. Uh, because I was trying to focus on what you were saying, but I know that storytelling was something that came out of that particular meeting. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So uh, I think I spoke next, but I don't think you guys have had enough time to take notes of what I mentioned as key elements. I think yeah, I'm, we I, can find common elements. Oh, do you want to do something, Autumn? Do you want to say something? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm sorry. I was, I started to kind of type down here, but then I wanted to, for the recording, I wanted to make sure that the screen was being shared with the thing that we were talking right. about. <laughs> and so yeah. Yeah, I, the recording gets take... in the way. <laughs> in the way I was like, okay, I can take, it was like, wait a minute. I can't like be taking notes and the meh is talking about something completely different than then, okay. you know, the folks who let's are watching this. it, let's it's going to be like, ah. let's, do let's do this. Let's take, um, so it looks like me and I both took notes of what you were saying, Autumn, about virtually connecting. So let's leave that to the end because that was the third one. And let's scroll okay. down to Mahas and then just take notes as like, write things and yeah. talk about them as you write them, right? Right. Uh, so there are also some the, common elements with what Mia said, so. Did you have some things that uh, stood out to you while Maha was talking, Mia? One of the things that stood out to me was the breakout activities that she was seeing and the focus on people. Mm -hmm. So the, um, you know, the fact that there were these breakout activities and what I wrote down was that she had had, uh, oh, wait a minute, my typer isn't working. My typer, my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, that um, she felt like she got to know like 15 to 20 people, Oop. Um, even though there were like 40 people in the room. Yeah, that's exactly what stood out to me as well. And I wrote it down in my own way by saying get, getting to, oh, it just went up there. It, Maha just took it and is going to put it somewhere else. But basically that idea of getting to know other people is an important um, part of the process and, this, um, and the outcome of the, of the way of proceeding. Um, it's not nice to just do something but not know the people you're doing with it too much. And so that if that outcome was important that much was something i i wrote down yeah yeah and that um it was as much people focused as it was task focused mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is what i wrote down mm -hmm. uh anything else i think there was stuff that was similar to what mia had said 
uh, about the meta aspect of it and the storytelling, right? I was talking about we were sharing our stories and our experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to, I'm going to put those here. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying, but it's like you're ahead of me. <laughs> I'm faster than you. Yeah, you are much faster that. than me. It's true. If you just give me a moment, I swear I'll catch up. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just give me like three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you talk about the things that we missed, Meha, and then I'll try to take notes. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure, sure. So the other thing that I think I said that we missed was how do you include people who are new to a space when there are people who are very experienced to a space? How do you set a prompt or how do you modify your prompt so that someone who's relatively new still has something to contribute? Uh, so that it's not like if knowing the audience, I guess, is one thing that's really important. Like you want you need to know how much people know to be able to make sure that your prompt is inclusive of the diversity of experience in the room. If that makes sense. I think that's sort of part of what I said. Uh, and I think I also, I think I also talked, I don't know if this is an element, but maybe, maybe the element of both breakout and interaction in the main room like there was interaction on both levels, like large group and small group. That's a good one, is that yeah. you have both, both experiences. Yeah, because I think there are people who enjoy one or the other more, but they're mm -hmm. also very complementary to be mm -hmm. able to have both, because at least you have the facilitators in the main room to... That you that you probably know will be welcoming or will react to people in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's mainly what what I had in mind. All right, now can we then go back to autumns? Autumns, we have notes from both Mia and myself already written there, right? I I was when you asked about the note taking, I realized that I was lagging in that department because. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. So by the time autumn came around, I, I had regenerated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so forgive me for that, for that, um, That's gap. Okay. No, um, no problem. So we have here autumn that, um, from your experiences of VC that maybe, um, that there's these two different spaces that exist, the virtual event and then, um, I mean, excuse me, the on-site event, and then people who are coming um, from the periphery who are in a virtual um, context. So when you're thinking about um, designing and planning, um, you're thinking about all the different spaces that converge in the experience, which is a really interesting thing. Um, so the larger group is dispersed, um, you know, but then there's a core that exists in, a, in the same place in some way. Um, and so you talked about um, thinking through how equity can happen in that dis, uh, dispersed virtual experience, as well as in a, a contained and collective um, uh, a space as well, simultaneously. That's a real challenge. Um, so it was nice to have you outline that and have us think about it. Um, so uh, the other thing I thought was interesting is when you said that those who are there in the space um, that is the centralized location for the conference in this case, um, are giving a gift to those who are bringing excitement and knowledge. Um, uh, you're bringing some of that excitement and knowledge to those that are dispersed. Um, I like the idea of the notion of a gift. Um, there's something very inherently um, human and generous in the notion of a gift, right? And so, and it, it makes it different than a report out or a, um, you know, on-site like progress report or something like that. So I like that distinction that you used in your language. Um, and um, trying to, you, you talked about trying to think about people who are there um, 
making sure that everybody is represented in their own way, whether it be the people on the ground in the conference, but even more so the people who are dispersed that are coming in from very different perspectives and very different spaces. But I think one very important thing you also pointed out is that there's an affordance of amplification that is embedded in the process as well. That is those who are in the conference are being amplified, their voices, their concerns, the work they're doing in real time in real space together are amplified in a way by this um, by this whole experience as well. So there's a kind of, um, you have to think about that like purposely and also diplomatically, et cetera. I just love that you brought all those um, challenges out. Um, yeah, so um, I'll be quiet. I think those are the things that mm. are sort of stuck out for me. I think Mia's notes are very similar to mine. I was just taking them with keywords rather than full sentences. But I think we covered the same thing, which just shows that Mia can write more words in less time than I can. <laughs> Autumn, is there something that you felt that you emphasized that um, the only word I think that I have is the word sanitary in, res in respect to paying attention to environments that I thought was yeah. a really interesting choice of word that Autumn said. Um, you know... I want to put that one in and then I'll delete my notes because I don't think I have anything else that's different. Uh, and then I'll let Autumn say, Autumn, do you feel we missed anything or you would frame something differently? Yeah, so this is such an amazing, this is such an interesting structure for me. I've never done this before. I kind of struggled with that, but being on this end of it, having you two listen and then giving back to me, I think both of you totally heard me. Um, but in hearing you give me back what I gave you, I also realized some stuff that I missed. So is, can I add one more word? And it's not of something course. that I said, yeah. <laughs> right? But I realized I'm like, oh yeah, this is huge. This is a huge element is the, the, the aspect of the host and the hospitality piece mm. of virtually yeah, connecting that that, <laughs> that doesn't could have interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't yeah. happen if you don't have at least two hosts who are um, making sure that hospitality is happening in an equitable way in the on-site environment as well as in the virtual environment, that you need those two people and that those two people have to have a good relationship with each other and that they need to be in communication with one another. And that if that's not happening, then, I mean, that's kind of the heart of the whole thing. So it's really funny. Um, yeah, when I first started talking, I was really nervous. I get really nervous <laughs> about like, yeah, you know, know why you know, I could sense that, but I wasn't sure I, why. I don't know why I get like that. I get really nervous about like talking about things, even though things that I know really well, if I'm not like super prepared. And so I missed like this really obvious thing, but I realized that I missed it in hearing the two of you talk to me about what I said. So thanks for letting me sneak that one back in because that's really well, important. Well, I kind of feel like what you, just, what you just described there could happen to students too, right? So I think if we're going to do an appreciative interview format in our class, we could tell students a day or two beforehand, come prepared to talk about a successful experience you've had of X. So if we're doing this for students, for example, to help them prepare for group work, we could say, you know, we're going to do this activity to help you work well together in groups and, and so come prepared to share an experience of group work that worked well for you or for example uh, research projects that they worked on that worked well for them or something like that but let them know ahead of time that that's what we're going to be doing so that if they want to prepare a story they can do that um, so normally what we would do next is that we would come together and highlight key elements of other people's stories which we did and then refine these into elements that we would take together into our next endeavor. Uh, and so, do you mind if I just try to do that really quickly? No, go. I'm fine with it. Mia, do you have anything? That sounds good. Go ahead. So, I'm just actually, what I would do is like copy paste some of this stuff. Um, so, we've talked about um, talking about values, we've talked about storytelling. I'm starting with the stuff Mia said, listening, uh, bringing out concerns about the meta elements. I think if you're ever doing professional development for faculty 
or educators that meta element is always there because your format and your content both need to can i just write it like that like the format and content i'll just write this next to the meta right format and content are important um where are you writing meta at the very bottom like under number two can you scroll down under what notes from Maha? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I think expensive and inclusive was a good combo that um, Mia brought out. And then thinking about some of the stuff Autumn said, I think the last one about hosts and hospitality is really important. Uh, equity that you mentioned, which goes well with the expensive and inclusive. So I'll put it underneath that. Um, and then let me go up and see again. So what we're organizing is a fully online event. So that part about on-site and virtual is tricky, although we don't know if people who are going to be joining us work together in a face-to-face -face environment and might have a chance at that point to be meeting together or not. So we don't actually know that. Um, I, I want to do something about the gift and excitement, but I'm not really sure um because in our context it won't be necessarily we're not necessarily organizing a hybrid event in the way that virtually connecting is but there's a lot that we want to learn from it so i'm trying to and you guys can help me out here um, i would say different voices represented is important i guess that goes under equity and expansion and so i'm just going to put this here ensure diff voices are and I think that maybe the gift goes under hosts and hospitality too, right? That um, yeah. maybe that's where I was trying. That's why I lost the host and the hospitality was because I said it as like giving a gift, right? Giving mm -hmm. a gift or sharing. Like I think about that's a very but, hospitable thing to but do. But I think the gift, but the gift isn't always from the host. Mm. But the gift sharing doesn't right. always come from the host. It comes from the guests who are on site, for example. But I wouldn't right? say the so host is there to I think... be hospitality. I would say that the, the host is there to facilitate hospitality. And so the gift can come from anywhere. It can come from any mm -hmm. of the people. But the host is there to make sure that the gift mm. is delivered more so than to give the gift, maybe. Yeah, I think I would add the I like word that. something I like the about, facilitation like, of hospitality. I think it has to do with generosity that the, mm -hmm. the word gift and mm -hmm. that generosity yeah, yeah. is yeah, a culture, I had generosity right? In my notes. Yeah. Yeah. I love generosity culture. I love that. Yeah. Um, is there anything else? I'm going to move on to mine, but um, any other things that we need to, I think the attention to environment and mm -hmm. this, this is important. I think it, even if there aren't people on site, everyone is on site where they're where they're at at home. Um, yes. And like the and the tension between, uh, you know, quiet and focused because you need to focus. Like sometimes one of one of the things is like it's nice that people are sweet about having children show up on camera, but the person who's presenting might be distracted by that. Like it's I like it when people react yeah. to it nicely, but it's sometimes not the thing that I want. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, to quite focus and send and, and just and sort of and spontaneity. <laughs> natural and spontaneous and realistic. Yeah. <laughs> spontaneous chaos. <laughs> yes. And, real, and authentic, I guess. Yeah, authentic. That's the word. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. What do we take? Is there anything else from what you both said that you think is a key element? We don't want to take too long on this, uh, but I want to take some stuff from what I said as well, but I'll let you guys do that. I think um, maybe the, the uh, breakout rooms and like that focus on that simultaneous of the larger group and then the smaller groups is something that's key. Mm -hmm. And I'll also mm -hmm. add um, getting to know people that you're speaking with. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not just sharing ideas immediately, but, but having a sense of who they are and where they're coming from. Mm. Okay, there was a lot common with uh, stuff that you said about storytelling and the meta aspect, so we don't need mm -hmm. to repeat that. 
Um, I think the other two here is knowing the audience, like as a facilitator. So this is not the people knowing each other, but knowing the audience as a facilitator. And mm -hmm. within that, ensuring that your design is inclusive of the new people. Yeah, of new and old. Because you also don't want it to be boring for people who aren't new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think Autumn didn't say, but I think virtually connecting tends to somehow, we were talking about this, uh, I was talking to Jesse about this the other day, is that how do you design this environment that is very friendly for people who know each other, but doesn't feel like this friendliness is clickish to the extent that others can't join in. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Digital Pedagogy Lab is also one of those spaces that there are people returning. Let's say new and returning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, returning Without, is a better word. Uh, boring <laughs> or excluding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not old. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do you think that captures most of it? We can always think of other things, but I think this is a good list of things. I think it's this a very is so good. cool. Okay, yes, shall we? Shall this we is like the best of everything that we've. <laughs> we just took all three. Yeah, and we took like yeah. the best of all of them and like combined them. That's really yeah. neat. It's that sort of um, uh, what do you call it? Distillation. That's really powerful. Yeah, I love it. Oh, your audio was cutting up. What did you say? This was the best one. We took the best of all three of yeah. our different structures, right? Oh. The different things that we're working well for us and we combine them. I'm not them. sure if it's me or if it's Autumn. We can hear you. I, I said that the distillation, hear each other. All the, the distillation of all the, the, the best in all three um, is very powerful to see. Uh-oh, can you hear us? I think she already stopped the recording. No, she didn't. Oh, okay. I'm going to stop screen sharing. Maybe that'll help. I was going to stop it because the, your voices were cutting up for me. I'm not sure. Hmm. I think no. it helped. So um, I'm not sure what happened there. So I might stop the recording earlier. I, I haven't stopped the recording yet, but I'll stop it now.